Welcome to my boudoir. It's a tiny attic crawl space. I went and took my socks off because I thought I was going to activate the camera lens with my foot. Then I didn't, which is probably just as well. <sighs> Can't really sit up comfortably, so I'm going to lay down comfortably. <laughs> see, I can adjust the camera with my foot. You can see my nifty lights in the background. I thought, having read some recent news about nuclear fusion, that maybe I'd see if I could riff for 20 minutes on nuclear fusion and teach y'all what the heck it is. Yeah. Nuclear fusion is different from nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is what you're familiar with when you think of a nuclear power plant and all that radioactivity. That's nuclear fission. Um, fission means to split, to separate. So what you're talking about there is splitting atoms, and you know that, right? You've heard that it's splitting atoms. So in nuclear fission, you're splitting atoms. Whereas in nuclear fusion, you're fusing atoms, you're putting them together. So they take, um, th there's a variety of ways they're going about it. Um, a variety of different materials they can use from helium to um, Deuterium. Deuterium is the heavy water stuff that they're using to cool off nuclear plants now, um, I believe. So anyways, they throw the atoms at each other and they melt together, um, is the, the, the basis of it. In order to do it, they have to recreate the conditions on the sun. Now what the sun is, is um, like the inside of a neon tube or, for, or a fluorescent lamp, it's, it's gases that are become plasma. That's what they use in, in plasma lamps, those little things where you put your hand over it and all the electricity comes through. Uh, that's plasma, and in fact, there's um, plasma, not blood plasma, that's something different. There's plasma um, TVs that I don't think they really, really made it, but for a while that was one of the technologies for television. And plasma is the stuff inside your neon tube, your neon lights. That you know, it's a glass tube. If you look at it in the daytime, it looks white, and then they add electricity, and all of a sudden you get different colors depending on the um, materials it's coated with, depending on the type of gas used, and depending on the color of the glass used. So they put all that together, and they get a rainbow of colors for your neon. So that's plasma. Plasma is what lights up, and and it, it's formed for a split second in the atmosphere when lightning goes off. There's plasma created by the electricity of the lightning. Now, in a way, you can think of nuclear fusion as lightning in a bottle. Because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to create a controlled, continuous lightning reaction in a bottle. Now, it's more like what's going on on the sun. But that can be hard to really fathom. Uh, it's, it's a little beyond the experience most of us have. I mean, other than a neon tube or a plasma lamp, we really don't run into plasma. And it doesn't tend to be very hot in those circumstances. They're, they're using extremely um, volatile gases or noble gases. And they're, they're, you know, things that reach that state at a low temperature. But you're not getting electricity, you're using electricity. So it's not going to work for an electrical power plant. The kind of fusion that generates power and... This is the funny thing, you see. In generating power, all of these technologies come down to the same thing. Take a bunch of water, stick it in a boiler, heat it up, and then the steam runs a turbine. That is everybody's favorite. The only thing that's different from that is hydroelectric, solar, and wind. But whether you're coal-fired, gas-fired, or nuclear-fired, it's all about applying heat to water and grabbing the steam with a turbine. So in this case, the heat they want to apply is coming from the fusion. Except there's a problem. The kind of fusion reaction they're working with burns hotter, that burns hot enough to melt anything on the earth. I mean, anything. It is the heat of the sun. You can fire anything you want in there and it will be burned. So, you know, I mean, if you want to melt gold, you use a, an iron crucible. If you want to melt iron. You can use ceramics. But there's a point at which even some ceramics will melt um, or explode or rupture or fail. So how are you going to contain a fusion reaction such as found on the sun? I think it was 4,500 degrees Kelvin. 
I don't worry about the numbers. Thing is, hotter than, I mean, if, if you were to drop a ball of this hot plasma on a rock, it would just burn itself through, assuming you could keep it running, which you couldn't. It would just do like lightning does. But you've seen what lightning can burn. That's the problem. Lightning can burn anything. So they've been working on magnetic cages, um, magnetic bottle, if you will, a magnetic jar. I know, well, that's what the Earth uses. The magnetic shield on the Earth is the primary protection from nuclear radiation from space. Now, radiation covers everything from sound to light to um, harmful radiation like x-rays and cobalt. It, it, radiation is what hits you when you get a suntan. The reason that we can survive from that radiation is because of this magnetic cage around the Earth created by the Earth's magnetic field. It does more than guide sailors with a compass. It actually causes stuff to bounce off the outside of the Earth. And indeed, the Star Trek force fields that we're, we, we've, we've been hearing about for so long, the idea of force fields, you know, shields up, magnetic cages. It's the idea that magnetism can repel anything if you can get it to work right. And that is the challenge that fusion reactors are facing. Um, being able to create a magnetic containment field sufficient to actually contain a volume. They can make magnetic force fields already that work, you know, as a single plate, you know, just a, um, a wall. They've got that technology, but that's not going to contain a fusion reaction. For a fusion reaction, you need to have six walls. Now, there are some plants operating elsewhere, like in France, where they do, in fact, have that system working. I don't remember the name of it, but you don't care. Um, they, they generate six of these magnetic walls. They're called two-dimensional walls. And, uh, you know, the corners get kind of hot. <laughs> and uh, we still haven't figured out how to get something from it. Because if we're containing the heat, then we're not sucking it off to heat steam. And um, can you stick a couple of wires in? Well, the wires are going to melt. How do you get the power off of it if the magnetic bottle is containing it? So the problem with the 2D wall is that, you know, you could put six of them together and create a cube around your little plasma ball, but um, for one thing, it's not the right sh shape for your plasma ball because it's a cube and your ball is a sphere. So you're going to have dead spots that are going to create havoc with your control and your plasma. But then there's the other problem that these guys in Germany have, and this is the breakthrough we had to, that I read about today, they have figured out that they can weave a pattern mathematically into 3D space. And if you ever seen one of those laser shows where they, they project lasers onto the clouds and they seem to make three-dimensional objects of light up there in the air with the lasers, um, or you've seen those little plastic cubes with the little dots all over inside and they make up a picture that's 3D, and you, you know, you put them on a little light. I, I'd show you one, but it's downstairs and I'm upstairs. And I'm not going to go get it. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's a pause button. I'll go get it. I'll show it to you. Alrighty then. I, gosh, I hope I don't have to edit this. I'm going to have to watch it and check in case I need to edit the time when I went downstairs to get this thing. So this is what I was talking about. The acrylic blocks with images etched into them in three dimensions. I'll put it against the dark there so you can see. If you turn it, you can see that the whole thing is there, full on 3D. It can't focus that close. Oh, and he's upside down. There you go. You can kind of see him. Close enough, anyway. Now he's made out of a bazillion teeny tiny dots. That I can't show you because the camera won't focus that close. But he's made out of a whole bunch of teeny tiny dots plotted on a graph using X, Y, Z coordinates. So you've got your regular graphs that are like this, and this one includes another dimension. So you've got up, down, side to side, and back and forth. And that's the third dimension, right? Because uh, 2D is up and down and side to side. Then you add the third dimension, back and forth. 
Fourth dimension is a subject for another day when I understand it well enough to explain it. <laughs> I'm still working on that, like string theory, for instance. That's intriguing, but it's way over my head still. Uh, so magnetic cages, yes. So you can plot something in 3D space using a computer. And that's what they've done with the magne magnetism, now exactly how they're firing out the magnetic beams. It didn't say in the article I was reading, and I didn't think to wonder. But uh, they are plotting those magnetic beams out on a three-dimensional space, creating a pattern. And the thing is, they had a, uh, what was it, a one, zero, zero, one in 100,000, no, a zero, zero, one percent, so that's one in 100,000 error rate in the um, expectation of the math versus the reality of the math, which is to say when they ran the numbers, it was almost perfect. And they were successfully able to contain a blob, a plasma, active fusion, um, actively doing its fusion thing with this bottle. And that, that's as far as they've gotten. Uh, they say they're not even going to try to get electricity out of the system because at this point they're demonstrating proof of concept. Someone else can turn around and figure out how to do that part. That's what science is like. It's, it's not supposed to be a case of I copyrighted this and you have to pay me to use it. Um, art isn't supposed to be like that. Science isn't supposed to be like that. People aren't supposed to be like that. You know, in an ideal system, we would all just walk into the center of town and drop our goods on the floor. I don't want this anymore. Then we'd walk around and we'd pull from other people's piles the things we did want. And that would include food, that would include maybe cards for services, you know. Whatever, whatever it was that you had to offer, you would simply offer it. And nobody would ask if you had done enough of it that week to have a right to the pile in front of you. Nobody would say, oh, well, you know, how many bathrooms did you clean? Because that's how many eggs you can have. Nor, ideally, would anybody take more eggs than they could eat before they went off. Um, you know, one of the problems with that system is the guy that goes, hmm, if I take all the eggs every week because there's nothing in the system to stop me, then I can turn around and my eggs will give me an opportunity to pick and choose from the people who get to take them in return for favors. And thus the greedy man is born. Um, that's a moneyless sy system. And he'd be like, well, yeah, I, I, I did take all the eggs. You're right, I've got them all. I could give you some. Uh, no problem, of course I'm gonna give you some eggs. You need eggs, I've got all the eggs. I'll give you some eggs. But first, I'm gonna need a little something from you. So, in science, they are not entirely that way. In medicine they've gotten that way. But in science they're still collaborating and sharing. So intellect willing, we may finally come up with fusion power. Now why do we want fusion power, I hear you ask. Because fusion power has no output except power. Uh, there's no emissions. There's no smoke, there's no pollution, there's no rods you have to bury in the earth for a million years. There's nothing that, um, you know, I, I suppose if, if, your nuclear, if your magnetic containment bottle failed, it could blow up your city um, or set fire to your forest or do something catastrophically nasty. So we're going to have to work on that too. But the power supply, imagine a car that runs forever without ever being fueled. That's, that's the potential. This is the potential for starships. This is the potential for endless power to run our cities. We can get there. We're working on it. You know, we, we worry so much about current affairs. We forget to pay attention to future forward affairs, like this nuclear fusion that we're getting. And um, we, we can have a world like that where there is enough for everybody. There's a few things we have to do first. You know, uh, we've got to perfect a few technologies, and it would be really nice to have more of you out there in the world uh, thinking about 
and helping with that. But then on the other hand, only those of you who are minded to be that way, I mean, you're not going not gonna to be very good at it if you don't like it, right? So we need more thinkers, uh, more idea people, more creative people. We need to support our artists because they are the thinkers, the idea people, the creative people. And they appear to have no output. If you just, you know, walk into their shop, most of the time there's not a whole lot there that you can say, oh, I know what to use that for. But at the same time, the um, practice of coming up with ideas improves the ability to come up with ideas, which improves the ideas. And being valued for that also enables a person to put more of themselves into it and get better at it. And you can't get good ideas out of people who are embarrassed about having ideas. So we need to support our artists, our thinkers, our writers, our creative people. We need to support them better. Um, the basic income concept that they're talking about in various places, that's, that's one way to support our artists. You see, our artists are also scientists, and we need to stop separating arts and sciences and put them back together because the artists and the scientists are often the same people. And even if they're not the same people because the scientists love math and the artists love design, they do have a lot in common. They can get along really well. The, um, you know, you just gotta put the ego away so you stop going like, well, yeah, but my way of thinking is better. I, you know, and, and part of that is by taking away that shame that we've put on people. You don't get people with big egos um, from praising them too much, actually. You get it from shaming them too much. And often people who get too much shame also got too much praise from a different quarter because someone was trying to make up for it. And you can't. <laughs> you can't make up for that. So we need to support the smart kids, not just the athletes. Uh, the ones that sit around and think all day, not just the ones that, you know, can tune a car, throw a football, pitch a baseball. We, we need to support these people. And uh, fusion, seriously, you may well live to see it. I think I will. You know, if I don't die this year, I'm not going to die till 2072. So I think I'll get to see that world where there's enough energy for all and possibly a world where we stop using money as a, as a carrot on a stick and start using it as a valid means of simple trade exchange, which is all it was ever intended to be. Just a way of, of not having to carry around all your goats just to go buy some eggs and, and or, or a wagon, you know? I mean, you just go, look, you know, this is what I have from my yesterday's trading and I now use it for today's trading. That's how it ought to be. And, uh, so, you know, who wants to schlep all their stuff around for a barter market? Mind you, with the internet, you don't have to schlep it anymore. Now you can just upload a picture. So uh, we may be able to, you know, someone, someone out there just might come up with a really good system for online bartering. That is a cool idea. You bypass the money. Now, that doesn't mean you bypass income tax. Just by the way, the government considers trade, trade goods to be, to have monetary value on which you're supposed to pay tax. So know your local laws. And if you're going to break them, Break them smart. Um, you know, anarchy isn't necessarily about uh, breaking the system. It's more about being smart enough not to run afoul of the system and supporting the parts of it that are working and ignoring the parts of it that aren't working. So if, if you go out there and you, you start working on a trade system, uh, especially a barter website, look into the tax laws because it's going to affect you, just so you know. Yeah, nuclear fusion is possible.